thank you, Ed. Yeah, we had a great time chatting on a show, actually. Ed asked me the toughest question I've been asked so far in the borough president run, and it was, what's your favorite ice place in Queens? <laughs> Lemon ice place in Queens. It's a lot of them. So I had to go with the coolies, which I've been there for 50 years, back in, back in the story. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, normally I don't dress like this, uh, well, I do when I'm not working. But um, I'm actually not supposed to be here. I'm on retreat this weekend um, at the Jamaica, uh, at the Bishop Moy Retreat House in Jamaica States. I've been going there with my dad for about 26 years now. He's there. Um, and so if you see any passionist brothers, don't tell them. <laughs> they think I'm probably meditating someplace. But I will be running back as, as soon as I'm done here. Um, I, I was going to speak about Borough President, I will, but I want to talk a little bit about public safety first because of what happened in the park here. Um, I've been speaking about this for 11 years now as your public safety chair. Um, and, you know, it's, crime has stopped going down. I mean, from 19, 1991, some of you look maybe old enough to, to remember this, but crime was out of control, right? It's 75% higher than it was today. And it was my father in 1991 who was the speaker who instituted the Safe Street, Safe City program. And he got Mayor Dinkins on board, and they both uh, went to Albany and got it done. And that increased the police force from 31,000 to 41,000. And that was the catalyst. That was the impetus. Um, you remember Brian Watkins got stabbed on the subway defending his mom by the U.S. Open? Um, that was the impetus that, and the catalyst that turned the city around. Could have gone either way back in 1991, but since then, crime is down 75%. And that's because we put those police on the force. Since 2001, right. over my vociferous objections, uh, and Mike's, uh, the police force has dwindled from 41,000 to under 35,000 cops, closer to where it was in 1991. And that's outrageous. There are just not enough of them anymore. Uh, crime has stopped going down. It's leveled off and started going up in some places. And I've been warning about that for some time. Two reasons. Number one, not enough cops. And number two, in, in 2009, uh, led, led by the um, drug. Um, the, uh, the uh, Albany, Albany, Albany got rid of the Rockefeller drug laws. They did not reform the Rockefeller drug laws. They got rid of them, which now means a drug dealer can get arrested one time, five times, ten times, and say, you're on a marijuana deal, come right back out of the street. So you have fewer cops dealing with more, and I wrote an op-ed on that back in 2009 in the Post. Uh, so you have fewer cops dealing with more criminals, more violent criminals, because they're drug dealers. And every drug dealer is involved in a, in a violent trade. Um, and that has now put us in a situation we're in. With, with regard to parks, because of the city's budget and hiring freezes, there has not been one new parks officer added to Queens in five years. Five years. It is an outrage. At one point in Queens this summer, we had two park offices for the entire borough of Queens. I have been out there screaming about it, yelling about it, having press conferences about it. I don't do that many press conferences, but it's been, but I've uh, been call, calling for more parks officers. Um, and the good news is that just recently, in the last month, we finally hired 81 new parks officers. 35 are already in the academy in Maryland's Island, and which hopefully it's a good idea. Hopefully, it's a great idea. Um, and now the question is going to be, you know, can we get the bulk of those uh, parks officers for Queens? Uh, because most of them are in Manhattan, the ones that exist are in Manhattan. Uh, we need them out here. We've got so much park land, uh, we've got no park purposes. And just the other day, I don't know if you saw it, I'm, I'm in the press about this massive fight, the beating that happened in the story park with these girls, girls of all things, who were attacking. Um, you know, a bunch of older girls were holding younger girls down, stomping on their head. It was pretty horrible. Right in the story park. And it went on for a while. Not one cop, not one park officer saw this. They weren't there. It's not like they saw it and ignored it. They just don't have it. They weren't there. And it allowed these girls to get beat up. So it's outrageous. So we've got to continue to keep public safety our number one priority. No matter what other electives might say. You know, we've got to let our police force do more than just sit in the car and stand on the corner. Not that you see them standing on the corner anymore. They need to use their training. They need to use their, uh, their experience and get out there and look for crime. That's what Stop and Frisk is about. That's all it's about. It tells police officers, don't just stand there. Get out there and look for those guns. Get out there and look for people who are sorry, who try, who may be committing crime. It doesn't say stop people willy-nilly. That's illegal. You've got to have a reasonable suspicion. But it tells, it tells our police force to be an active police force, which is why even though we have less, we've still been able to hold the line on crime. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of a public safety uh, uh, update as well as what's going on there. We really have to concentrate on that. 
I've been public safety chair for 11 years, um, working very closely with Ray Kelly to keep crime down 35% since 2001. Okay, um, uh, and um, uh, so I have this law and order reputation, which there are a lot worse reputations to have than, than a law and order guy. So, uh, but there's a lot more to me as I'm running for bar president. I'm getting out and speaking to people. You know, I'm an environmentalist. I see you have a recycling day coming up. Uh, I wrote the city's plastic bag recycling law. I put in the first tire reform recycling law, which I hope happens. Um, I'm, a, I'm an animal rights activist. Uh, I wrote the law, which doesn't allow people to tie animals up constantly on leashes. Um, I'm trying to get an animal abuse registry passed, but a convicted of animal abuse is going on this registry. You can't get another animal. Right now, you can go adopt five more dogs. Uh, buy five more dogs. There's nothing stopping you once you, you know, after you abuse an animal, of getting another animal. I'm really trying to move this animal abuse registry, it's called. Um, I'm a musician. I play four instruments. Uh, I'm a um, sports nut. I play, my, my daughter is uh, at St. Francis Prep now, and she's second, uh, MSG Varsity second team all city volleyball, so she's on my volleyball team now, which is so cool. So we play together. Um, and we actually uh, made it to the championship last year. And uh, I, ride my, I ride my Harley sometimes. So there's a lot of things about me people don't know. Uh, I'm running for bar president, and there are a lot of good people running for bar president. Some forgetful people, but a lot of good people are running for bar president. But the only experience they have, and some of them are friends of mine, the only experience they have is in government. That's it. Nothing wrong with that. We've been running the government for 27 years. But I think you need to bring something to the government. And what I bring, and by way of experience, is two things. I bring the, 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 the values that this room has, first of all. And the experience I have is, number one, in keeping us safe for a long time. Before I was a public safety chair, when I graduated law school, I was a prosecutor for six years. So I have the knowledge necessary to continue to make public safety a priority. The second thing I bring that no one else brings is actual business experience. Before I was elected, I ran my family's small law firm, which has been at the same location in Queens since 1932. There's about five people in it. I know what it's like to make a payroll. I know what it's like when government hits us with high taxes and, and, and fines our businesses and over-aggressive enforcement and just this, just this morass of city agencies and bureaucracies that bit our businesses have to go through. It's the small businesses of Queens, it's you guys, that are the backbone of Queens. And everybody's going to come in and tell you that, but they say it now because I've been saying it. <laughs> and they can say it as much as they want, but they don't understand small business. They don't have any idea what small business is about. I'll give you an example. One of the other borough president candidates, a couple weeks ago, you wouldn't even know this, passed a law that he sponsored that would now raises joblessness to the level of race and gender if you discriminate against someone from being jobless when they come to you for a job. And they had little rallies saying, you know, you shouldn't have to get a job, you shouldn't have to hold a job to get a job, and, and you know, no, stop discriminating against the jobless. And they, I think they actually thought they were doing something good. But as a business person, I tried to explain to them, nobody listened. This law says that the second you don't hire somebody who's unemployed, they can take you the next day to the Human Rights Commission. So the other elected said to me, oh, so what? If you, if you didn't discriminate, what do you have to worry about? I'm trying to run a business. I don't have to, a day to go to the Human Rights Commission. I don't have time to get sued in court. I don't have attorneys to pay. And how am I going to prove that I didn't hire this person because they didn't have a job? Do I have records of everyone else that I hired that to say this person was jobless when I hired them, that person was jobless when I hired them? It's going to cost businesses. It's going to cost jobs. And it's going to hurt the jobless because now businesses won't even interview them. They don't want to wind up in the Human Rights Commission the next day in case they don't hire them. So now they're just not even going to bring them in for an interview. Um, so that's the kind of thing. It's insider baseball. Um, but that's the kind of thing that elected officials pass every day in all the city council that hurt small businesses because they are not small business people. Um, I am. I'm a business person. I'm a, law, I'm, I'm a safety expert. And those are going to be my priorities as well. Everybody has different priorities who's running. Um, yeah, but those are my priorities, and I believe those are your priorities. And the last thing I bring to this campaign that no one else does is a real long record of leadership in Queens County. You guys, I, I, I think you, you know me, and, but I'm just a council member from far away, up in Queens. Up in Queens, up in Astoria. Uh, you story. Know, not, not that close to me, but you've heard of me because I've been out there. I don't have press conferences. I can tell you the amount of press conferences I had on, on, on one hand. Um, I, I, I just work hard for Queens County, 
When the blackout of Northwestern Queens hit, I was out there taking on Con Ed. When our streets weren't plowed in the blizzard, the Christmas blizzard, uh, took about a year and a half, years ago, um, I was the loudest voice out there, screaming for the plows, holding the hearings, making sure the plows came the next time. Um, when they took our civic virtue statue from outside of Queens Borough Hall, the only one out there saying, we don't have any statues. This is Queens' only statue. How dare both of them take it from us? It's now in, it's now in a cemetery in Brooklyn. We, got a, we have a big hole outside of Queens Borough Hall where a statue used to be. Um, and, and lastly, it's not all that important, but it is indicative of, of leadership in Queens County, the Queens Borough Bridge. When Manhattan came for the bridge, when the mayor and the speaker said, we want to rename the bridge that is named for the borough of Queens, I was the only one who stood up for Queens County. We were threatened. Everyone was threatened. If you oppose the mayor and speaker on this, there's going to be ramifications and consequences. I don't care. I represent, I've been going throughout Queens. Nobody in Queens wants this to happen. It's our bridge. If you tried to, to change the name of the Brooklyn Bridge, Marty Markowitz would still probably be handcuffed to the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> no one would even think of changing the name of the Brooklyn Bridge, ever. But the Queensborough Bridge was okay. It was okay to sell the Queensborough Bridge for an endorsement, to, get, to make us call it the Ed Koch. I had no problem with Ed Koch. He was a good friend of my dad, a good friend of mine. He always endorsed me every time I ran. There's a beautiful building next to City Hall called the Municipal Building. Name that after Ed Koch. Maybe and I'm still, by the way, if I'm our president, I'm still going to work to do that, to change the name of the municipal building to Ed Koch and get us our bridge back. I think it's an outrage. Thank you. Thank you, Lady Green. <laughs> Not the most important thing in our lives, but it is an example of someone who led for Queens. It wasn't successful because no one stood up for me. No one in City Hall said people. Um, uh, but, uh, and they were all afraid. But I'm not going to I'm going to get out there and fight for Queen's fair share. I'm going to fight for, our, for, for more cops. I'm going to fight for more park officers and for our, our fair share of those cops and those officers. You know, the, most of the cops in the office, like I said, they're in Manhattan. Our Queen's precincts are at half strength than they were in 2001. Half strength. We used to have beat cops. We used to have bike cops. Remember those bike cops? Yeah, yeah. Not anymore. It's not that they don't like to ride the bikes. They just, they just don't have, they don't, don't have the cops anymore. Um, so. Um, I want to leave some time for questions, but th those are my priorities. I think they're your priorities. Um, and um, I hope to uh, have your support from our president. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bill. I just wanted to know uh, what your opinion was on the IG for the police department. Good question. Yeah. Um, the, the, the IG. Um, I don't support it in its current form, but I don't know what its current form is. There is no proposal on the table right now. Um, and there's, I don't know if the proposal is for an independent IG, for an IG that's part of the um, uh, department investigation, if there's some other proposal on the table. They went to the press with it, the yes. city council, but they didn't go to the public safety chair. <laughs> they sure went with me. They yeah. sort of went right around. It has to come from my committee. Um, so I don't know what the proposal is, and I've said that I would consider it, but um, I'm not leaning for, towards it right now because this, the NYPD is the most overseen police department in the entire probably the country, the world, I mean. I mean, it's got five district attorneys, two U.S. Two US, two U, two US attorneys. It's got uh, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, the, ma the Mayor's Commission on Corruption. It's got my committee, the Public Safety Committee. That's what I'm charged with. So there's a lot of oversight there. Um, but, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't ruled it out. I'd like to see the IG proposal. The bigger problem, though, the bigger problem is the IG is paired with another bill, which they call the Community Protection Act. I call it the Criminal Protection Act, but it has a majority of city council members who have signed on. This is what it says. It's obviously in opposition to stop and frisk. And it says, uh, anyone stopped uh, by, the by the police who's part of a group that stopped disproportionately has an automatic right to a lawsuit. Doesn't mean you have to actually, you don't even have to allege anything in the lawsuit other than I'm a member, not, for example, men are stopped 95% of the time. Why? Because women are not doing the shooting. Okay, if cops are looking to have, they need to use reasonable suspicion to stop people they think have guns, it's most likely not going to be a woman. Um, so men are stopped 95% of the time. So what this bill automatically means is that if you're a man and you're stopped, you, all you have to do is say, I'm a man, I'm stopped, and you have a right to go to court. Now everybody says, all right, so what? So this is, the, again, the same council argument. So if you have nothing to worry about, what's the problem? The problem is that you can't have every one of our police officers spend every day in court every time they make a stop. It would shut down the police department, it would shut down our court system, it would probably bankrupt the city. 
But these knucklehead council members, a majority of them, have signed onto this bill called the Community Protection Act. And it's, it's a partner bill with the Inspector General. Right. Um, so that is really the big problem we have out there. You probably haven't heard of that bill, um, and uh, I would pay attention to it because it's moving forward um, as a part as part of this uh, Inspector General bill, and I'm fighting it uh, with every fiber of my feet. Yeah. I'm not going to let it go. Sure. Yeah. The uh, Boston bomber probably would not have been, would still be looking for him without surveillance cameras. Very important. Uh, what's your opinion about surveillance cameras? I am the city's most vocal advocate for surveillance cameras. I've been fighting the ACLU every step of the way. Um, thank you, thank you. I mean, surveillance cameras, public, you, we have basically given up our, we don't have a right to privacy in public places. And that's that's well said the law. Surveillance cameras should only be in public places. If they're not, then we have a problem. Um, and those surveillance cameras in Boston, by the way, that's all private. Here in New York City, at least we have some police cameras. But they're lucky they had private companies with those cameras out there. Otherwise, we'd still be in danger. We'd still be in danger. And that's the, every day you turn on New York One, turn on some station, you'll see pictures of criminals that were caught on surveillance cameras. So not only are they a deterrent, when you catch the who committed the crime, now that guy's not going to commit any more crime. Because, again, I'm a public safety expert. It's, when you see a, ro a robbery in the street, it's not somebody who woke up one day and said, you know what, I'm going to rob somebody. It's a career criminal who's done this forever. When you get that person off the street, you keep them in jail. That's how crime starts going down. Um, the other thing about Boston, I, I Facebooked this today. I have a pretty active Facebook page. If anybody wants to, to join, it's about like 8,000 followers. But I was speaking to Peter King last night. Um, he's a good friend of mine, and I think he's doing a great job uh, at, down, down in Washington. Um, and the president's first words yesterday were, we want to know why, you know, what would turn uh, young men who've grown up in this country to violence against America. My first reaction to that was, well, Peter King held a hearing on that very topic. <laughs> and nobody on the Democratic side, and I'm a Democrat, nobody on the Democratic side cooperated in that hearing. They all lambasted Peter King and called him racist and all kinds of names. And now it's our number one question, how could these kids have, turned, have grown up here and turned into terrorists? Well, that's what Peter King had a hearing on, and that's the kind of law enforcement we need to do, even if it's controversial. You need to have people with the guts to do that kind of stuff. Okay. Arlene. I only remember ladies being borough president. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really only remember ladies being borough president, and I'm just here listening to all of your qualifications. I just have a question for you. I mean, I'm not a lady. I'm not a lady. <laughs> That's a question, sorry. I mean, no disrespect, but why aren't you running for mayor? <laughs> I get that a lot. I, I do get that a lot. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I don't really remember. There's a uh, Helen Marshall, Claire Schulman. Donald Manus before that, but he's not the representative of the male, male race. That's, that's for sure. Um, so I don't know that's as far back as I remember. Um, but the mayor's race, um, there aren't that many people left in the city that have our values. I'm a, I'm a conservative Democrat, and I am very, very lonely at City Hall, as you can tell by what I've just been saying to you. Um, you know, aren't many, many of us like, but left like you know, Mike Miller. And um, in the Democratic primary for mayor, um, I could probably do pretty well against the class that's in there right now. But the problem is, if you don't get 40%, it's a runoff. And the runoff comes down to the top two people. And I think that system in this city is going to ensure that a very progressive liberal Democrat is always going to come out of the Democratic side uh, when it comes to the mayor's race. I, I would like to see that change. I would like to see the runoff requirement change. Um, I don't have a problem with uh, nonpartisan elections, every other Democrat does. Um, I would like to see it uh, so that people, I would like to see it set up so that people like us would have a fair shot at taking um, some of those higher offices. But right now, I don't think it's going to happen. I'd like how Jim Bloomberg does, run as a Republican. Then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have no competition right now. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> We're just going to do two more questions, Maria. Yes. Um, I love your position on uh, the police, the public, 
box, we need more police, and we need more police in the box. In addition to that, I love the position on illegal conversions and uh, the fire hazards that come with the uh, illegal conversions and the fact that the buildings department does not inspect. They just give tickets, violations, and they never go back to find out what's going on. That's why we had a building collapse on Jamaica Avenue last week. I'd like to ask you, as a small business person, what do you think of the vendors that are getting all these rights of uh, the reduction in their fines, the fact that they can go anywhere they want and park their vendor uh, court and sell food when our restaurants are suffering? Uh, this one. When people put my Facebook post, I just Facebook posted on that. Yes. Really? Um, and I supported, uh, it was about food trucks and it was about vendors. That's right. And my quote in the papers, because I give the same speech everywhere, by the way, and I hope you guys liked it, but it's not all that popular in other places <laughs> where, I give, where I give this speech, as you might imagine. But I don't change what I say to different groups, and I, and I, I never will. So um, what I, the reason I wanted to show you on Facebook is it's not just something I'm telling you. I posted and I said at City Hall that our brick and mortar restaurants and yes. merchants are the backbone of Queens County. That's not something I just say as a you know political thing. It's something I believe. And unfortunately, um, they, we're losing jobs, we're losing business because of the proliferation of these vendors, some legal, some not. Legal. And the food trucks, especially. I don't mind the food truck, but right now. There's no regulation on where the, the there's no regulation on where they can be after the meters end. They, they're supposed to not be at a meter. Not that anybody's out there checking that. So when the meters stop at seven o'clock or something, you could potentially have 15 vendors in front of all of your um, in front of all of your. Uh, I think Martha, Martha's been running my campaign. I think. Um, what did I write? I'm getting all back into this now. Unbelievable. Uh, the lack of rules that exist right now have led to the wild west side, the wild east side. And the outer boroughs being left to fend completely for themselves, uh, said Ballone. He, he, um, he insisted that rule, new rules are needed. Our brick and mortar establishments are the backbone of Queens County, and they're going out of business on a daily basis. So I, I, I said this yesterday. It's something I really believe in. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with a limited number of vendors and food trucks. They're part of um, you know, the fabric of New York City. They're, they're helpful to our immigrant communities. They have to be legal. And especially, you know, our, biz, our, our restaurants, how can they compete? Not only do they have to pay tons in taxes, not only do they have to pay a staff, um, but they kind of deal with the, uh, the health department, which shows up there three times a year and makes them do thousands of dollars of changes and fines. Well, nobody in the case say they're inspecting these food trucks, but I haven't seen one. I haven't seen an inspection on a food truck. They don't have the A, B, and C system or anything like that. So, yeah, so the food truck argument is, well, we're there because the consumer wants, consumers want us. Of course they want us. They want you because you can buy a 50 cent slice of pizza for them because the guy in the, in the brick and mortar shop can't sell it that cheap. Now, I would love to lower all the costs so they could sell it a lot cheaper. That's my number one alternative. But we've got to ensure that our brick and mortar places are, are taken care of because they're the ones employing, employing our people, they're the ones paying our taxes, and they're not being treated fairly right. Thank you. Okay. All right. last, last, last question, Ben. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we know a lot about what the mayor does, we know a lot about what the city council does, uh, we have some idea what the community board does, but really, <laughs> what is the role of the borough president? That's a very and good question. And that's more of an education. Because the borough president's office is not anywhere near as powerful as it used to be, and ironically, that's because my father took their power away. <laughs> so when I get back on retreat now, I'm going to remind him. <laughs> Um, but he did the right thing back then. Uh, he gave the power to the city council because it's a more elected representative, more elected, uh, it's closer to the people. But for our president powers, um, we still have uh, it's still, we still have some powers. It has a lot of um, say over. It has a five percent of the Queens capital budget goes through the borough president's office. So our priorities um, will be uh, will be uh, we can make sure the capital money goes to those like police precincts and, and, and training facilities. Um, I happen to be, uh, I happen to think senior citizen uh, residences and, and centers are very, very important because they're the ones who built this community and they need to, they're the ones who need to be able to stay in this community. Um, and so, so um, uh, my, my parents are seniors now, so I have to be nice. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> but uh, he's sleeping he's getting up today. Uh, so we do have a lot of capital money. We have appointments to community boards. We have a say in every land use thing that comes up, every big issue. Like, I wish I had more time, but you know, Major League Soccer, the U.S. Tennis Center, well, it's points. You know, I, I could talk about those for a half hour. Um, but the borough president has a, has a say in all of that, where it's not, not dispositive. It's just, um, uh, it's just a, uh, um, uh, it basically has to weigh in on all of these things. And it's an important, it's an important say. Uh, but the biggest thing the borough president has right now is the pulpit, is the bully pulpit. I have been able to do what I've been able to do as a council member for Queens. I'd be able to do so much more as borough president. You see, what, now I'll look at the rest of the borough presidents, and you can see what they do best. I'm going to bring that to Queen. Scott Stringer, good friend of mine, he does a lot of policy, very smart guy. I'm going to do a lot of policy. Work, get the experts in there, and how do we build after standing? You know, how, how to keep us safer, how to keep us clean and recycling and things like that. How to do, put out policy statements. The second thing, Ruben Diaz, I don't agree with him a lot, but he's up in the Bronx. Um, but he's involved in the city hall a lot. He and I, this is actually his idea. I put a gun offender registry in, which is very helpful here in New York City. It's one of the reasons murders are down to the lowest level in the history of New York City. If you commit a crime with a gun, you're in a registry for five years. And um, you have to report to the police precinct.